Sandcast Beach Volleyball with Triborn and Travis McWhorter brought to you as always by our guys at Kona, which my man Lee Feinswog is proudly displaying to the camera, along with Ed Chan, the editors, owners, uh, writers do everything at volleyballmag.com. How are we, gentlemen? Welcome to California, Lee. The other LA. <laughs> yeah. I live in Louisiana, LA. This is L period. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Most people don't get that. Right. <laughs> Where are you from? The other LA. Yeah. But proud to quaff a Kona <laughs> in Sandcastle. Now, most people probably don't know this, but I named Sandcastle. You did. Ah, and yeah. I decided That's it would right. be Sandcast, and I decided to, it would be all capital letters. Yeah. And I don't remember why Travis and I were just kicking the idea around, and I said, Sandcast. Yeah, because yeah. it was the Sandcast, and you said, no, it's just Sandcast. Yeah, it's kind of catchy, though. Yeah. It's caught on. Yeah. Do you have t-shirts yet and stuff? We do have t-shirts. We have t-shirts. We have some hats. Uh, sweatshirts. Rafi Paulus wears our sweatshirt like everywhere. I mean, it's Double X t shirt. I mean, you know. Yeah, I can get you one. Okay, we don't okay. have any polos or not. I don't <laughs> want polos. We're not a formal I've worn this. So we're here, to, we're here because, well, I'm here, and, and Ed is, Ed, Ed's in California. He lives in San Diego. But I came because I'm here out here for meetings with P1440 and stuff, and we yeah. did the media photo shoots today. Right. So that's why I'm wearing you know, the company logo. And, it is too, although this is actually a collector's item because the new logo has the P1440 colors sure. and the little, right. you know, volleyball in there. So um, we'll, we'll be getting new stuff. Yeah. I'm all into swag. <laughs> <laughs> and say something, will you? Loving it. There you go. <laughs> Ever the talkative when, photographer. When, so when we got together and, and bought the magazine, Ed and I have known each other a long time. We knew beforehand, but, you know, it was always just slight interactions. You know, he, he'd be shooting pictures. I'd be writing stuff. And, he had explained to me that you know, he was the, the shy guy. And I said, well, I kind of gathered that. And you can imagine I go into an empty room and have a good conversation. <laughs> well, there's a reason I'm normally behind the camera. <laughs> this is the wrong side of the camera. You don't meet like too many extroverted photographers, though. I feel like it's sort of, it's just the way it goes. Like most people who do the photos and the videos are the introverted ones. And on the other side of the camera is where you get the extroverts. They're, they're notable exceptions. So. Yeah. Mike Gomez, you know, and for sure. It's definitely out there, but as a rule, yes. Let's just say Ed's no Andy Lee Woods. <laughs> so we won't see him on Mike, you know, night, late night TV or anything. <laughs> well, this is like, you know, as late night TV as it gets in the volleyball world right now. No, but this is pretty oh, cool. Yeah. So, so, you know, we're at Tri's house. And, uh, oh, you're not supposed to tell anyone. Yeah. Everyone thinks we're at Manhattan Beach I was Pier. Just, I was just going to say, <laughs> you may find this hard to believe, but we're, we're not green screen. But he's got this great nook right here where the yeah. show is set up. It's perfect. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. they told me, so remember, like, uh, on my, my TV show back in Baton Rouge is called Sports 225. It used to be called Sports Monday. And it's actually in its 25th year. But I never forget when we went to a virtual set for the first time. So you're in a green screen, which is in a green room. Right. And the only thing there are the two chairs and a little table. But when people watch, you just see all this stuff. Yeah. Well, we did the first show with the virtual. And the next day, a friend of mine said, God, that was really cool. He goes, I know you were doing the virtual, but why did you have that table right in front of you like that? And I said, that wasn't a table, it was the floor. And they couldn't figure <laughs> out a way. So the floor actually floated up and looked like we were sitting in front of this table that cut us off. <laughs> yeah, because and there's a reaction to everything that happens. You know, we since got it down. But right. Yeah. So not doing this in front of a green room is uh, kind of comforting. <laughs> yeah, we're, not, we're not quite there yet. Plus, when you wear green on accident, and then you just look. I got this Kermit the Frog um, mug where he's a reporter. So it's Kermit the Frog here for the Muppet News, and he's got a little mm -hmm. microphone, yeah. and he's got the hat that says press. But, of course, Kermit's green. Right. So the first show, first couple yeah, shows, I, 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 I drink the water and all you see was my hand. And I didn't realize it while we were doing it until after you saw it yeah. on the, sh you know, on the replay. I was like, Ooh, that's, that's great. So he's on, he's on my desk now. <laughs> yeah. Well, give us, I guess, give us a rundown. Like I know a fair amount about the volleyball mag story and how you guys kind of got together, but I don't think our many of our listeners 
sort of know how you guys ended up being the owners of Volleyball Mag and, and like the incredible growth that it's gone under in the last like three and a half-ish years that you yes. have it. Yeah, well I mean all culminated by the fact that we're now part of P1440 which right. is so exciting for us. Well, you start by telling them how you, you've been a beach volleyball player and subscribe to the magazine. Yeah, so I've subs subscribed since the beginning which was about four years ago and it used to be this big newsprint thing you know, that came out. Like a physical magazine? Yeah, well, <laughs> back, yeah back in the day, it was a big, but thick magazine. It was enormous. Magazine. Yeah. It was enormous, and it was newsprint. Mm -hmm. And in, in those days, it took about three months for the results to get out. So the U.S. would go to world championships, and you find out how they did in the magazine like two months later. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody cares about volleyball in the 70s. Right, right. right. You know, so, you know, the sport grew, and as a Sport grows, the magazine grew, and um, one day, you know, we, we could tell that the enthusiasm for the magazine was dwindling because the pages got smaller and smaller. And now, smaller. are you going fast forwarding to now, like when we got to? I'm the getting to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're missing out the whole point, though, that you had become a freelance photographer for the magazine for a very long time. Yeah. Like, what year did you start? 2007. I started with the magazine. Yeah. So, and I had never even. Oh, actually, I take that back, because my wife is a former legendary high school volleyball coach. Tra Travis has met Brenda, and she's a lovely she has, and uh, she um, would get, with the magazine would come, and I would look at it, but I never really gave it any, any thought, you know, it's just like, you know, there it was. So he, he was working for him the whole time. So in 2011 and 12, I wrote for NCA.com. So you remember when CBS made the big billion dollar deal for the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And the, they tied in with TBS. Well, TBS is and, and, and TNT and the True Network, that whole package. Well, they're owned by Turner. Okay. And part of that deal was NCAA.com went to Turner. The NCAA has nothing to do with NCAA.com. It's run by Turner. Well, a buddy of mine ran that whole operation. He hooked me up and I freelanced for them for the whole year. So I got a couple of great volleyball stories that tie in. So anyway, I covered like 13 national championships, wrote like 90 stories. They spent $18,000 on me alone that one year on expenses, travel expenses, <laughs> all that everywhere. It was so much fun, and I got to write all sorts of volleyball stories. So I yeah. covered indoor women's championship, the NCAA men's championship, both water polos, the Final Four, the BCS, all the lacrosse championships up in Massachusetts, um, some D3 stuff. Anyway getting to do all that and just having a great time. So in the spring of that year, in May, the men's championship, the Final Four, was at USC. And it was USC, UC Irvine won, that was the last year that John Sparrow was coaching UC Irvine with all okay. that speculation, I don't know if you remember Ooh. that. About <laughs> you beat me in the national championship. Yeah, but you remember all that speculation that they were gonna go to, that he was gonna leave and take the UCLA job yeah, because yeah, yeah. Um, the legendary coach at UCLA was retiring after 50 years, Al Skates, and uh -huh. Spira was the guy going back, and, and, and Fergie was coaching USC, and called yeah. him the golden boy, you know, <laughs> in the press conference, to just to have a little bit, anyway, so, and Sarah Hughes' brother, Connor, served the walk-off ace to win the national championship mm -hmm. in, in there. Anyhow, in my whole <laughs> daylight center, right? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, as we're getting ready to play the semifinals, I'm seated, my, here, here's mid-court, my seat is here, and next to me is a, a woman named Aubrey, who was the editor of Volleyball Magazine, and we just made acquaintance. Now, I didn't think anything of it because, you know, I was doing the NCAA.com stuff. Well, I had never seen an, a men's volleyball match in person. My first match was going to be the national semifinals. So it's like an hour and a half before the match, and Hugh McCutcheon comes by, and he comes over, and we see each other, and, you know, I knew him from, he was, he had finished his first year in Minnesota, and we'd done interviews, and right. we, we shake hands, we visited him, and he, he, I could tell he was out of place, and I looked at him, and I said, Hugh, you sneaked in here, didn't you? He goes, yeah. And he said, <laughs> you don't have a credential or a, pack or a place to sit, do you? And he goes, no. I said, well, I happen to have two seats, and I'm not using one. Ah, oh, that'd be great. My first men's volleyball match, I sat with Hugh McCutcheon. For the whole match. During the National Championship? Or yes. Something? And that's how I learned more that day than you can possibly imagine. And what was really cool was, to, for, that was on, uh, like, say, 
I think it was Thursday, Saturday, that was Thursday, and then Monday he had invited me to come down to Anaheim to the training center. Okay. And they were just a few weeks out from making cuts for the he 2012. He was still the head coach of the U.S. National Yeah, the women's team. Point, right? Yeah, they oh, were getting ready for the right, London okay. Olympics. Got it. And so I got to go after that to the training center. Anyway, I'm getting to the part where Ed jumps back in. <laughs> but, no, but this is relevant because then the following July, I'm at USA Volleyball Nationals uh, as a club director, Volleyball Baton Rouge, and having a great time and I'm talking to all sorts of college coaches and taking notes for all these stories I'm going to get to do in the fall. Yeah. And my guy from Turner calls and says they're firing all the writers they're not going to use anybody. They're getting rid of all of us. They, he kept his job but <laughs> all they cared about was the final four and the sports information directors were going to file and stuff. And I was so bummed. Yeah. In August all of a sudden I was like wait I sat next to the editor of Volleyball Magazine. I sent her a note Aubrey Everett and said, I'm a free agent. Could you use me? And you guys have never seen the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but it's kind of like where he goes, well, considering I'm desperate, you're exactly what I need. <laughs> so that's how I got with the magazine. So I kept up with them. You know, I wrote, you know, four, five, six years as a freelance writer yeah. for Volleyball Magazine, which had a very limited website and it, a drastically diminishing <laughs> circulation, print population, and and the magazine kept getting smaller. Yeah. And that's where Ed jumps in. Thank you for letting me do that. Much <laughs> but I thought that was relevant to explain to you, sure. you know, how I got into it. Yeah. You know, yeah. So. So, the magazine was shrinking, and we had a person on the inside, Megan Kaplan, and I put in a word with her that when the pain point gets the, gets the publication enough, let me know, and we'll offer to buy it. So one day she hit that point, um, made a call, hey, you guys interested in selling? And um, said yes. I'm, dr I'm driving to Houston. Okay, and I'm on you, you had started Destination Volleyball. Well, yeah, right. see, I, I had, uh, even though I was still writing for Volleyball Magazine, I had started that website called DestinationVolleyball.com so I could do more stuff just for the fun of it. Right. And I had decided to put together a team to put Volleyball Magazine out of business and take over. <laughs> no, seriously. And and we, we could have done it. I mean, I rounded up all the troops and it was going to be, you know, I ponied up a bunch of my own money and had gotten all the plan. I'm driving to Houston. I'm on I-10. Ring, ring. And I look down and say, Chan, and uh, what's happening? Oh, we can buy Volleyball Magazine. You want to buy it? And I said, sure. He said, okay. And that was it. That was the business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's how we became publishing magnates. <laughs> So how did you guys actually meet, though? Because you were... I was the know. photographer, and he was the writer. So oh, yeah, and worked final, together. at Women's Final Four, okay. generally. Got it. Um, we started a tradition, of uh, which you'll finally get to be a part of this yeah. year, where we have a Friday night dinner. Okay. Um, where we, we... It's a big gathering. Okay. Um, it's at a place called Overeaton in Pittsburgh on Friday night, Love December Pittsburgh. 20th or whatever. Oh, I know. You have family there and friends yeah. there. So we have, but uh, you might get a few extra fans there now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What time? <laughs> 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 the reservation is on the way. So um, uh, we sat next to each other a couple of times, you know, and got to visit and got to know each other over the course of that time. And you couldn't have two people from two different worlds. Um, in, in so many virtual, physical, literal ways, yeah. you know, f to be partners and good friends. Yeah. yeah that, and so when he when he said, "Yeah, we could buy it," I said, like, "Yeah, okay." Called my wife. Said, "We're buying volleyball magazine." What's that mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I've hated him ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. So, so we we immediately once we, once we acquired the assets and we immediately made the decision. You know, everything we've done is mutual. And, and we, we, we don't, we, we've no, gone, we battled over a couple things, and I usually win because my personality is so much stronger. <laughs> and it's not really strong with that stuff. But, but we, uh, we, we agreed we had to kill the print. The print was, was negligible at that point. It's real cost, costly, and everybody, people read, we, we know from Google Analytics that they're reading, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, something like 20% on a computer and 50% on an iPad and the rest on a phone, right. something like that, maybe, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And we decided that we would change the focus to become the daily digital news source of volleyball. And with with limited resources that we hope would go. Right. Well, so we we recognize you know, the, the, cat, the, the, you know, the main focus has to be women's indoor. Okay, that's the biggest thing. And then Pro Beach. And then Women's College Beach. And then 
you know, somewhere in there becomes men's men's indoor. I love men's indoor. And Mick Haley, the legendary volleyball coach, Mondays with Mick. We do it every week. You should watch. But Mick <laughs> said years ago, he goes, athletic directors in America are missing the boat on men's volleyball. They could sell out arenas. People would just love it. It's such a great sport. And it's low budget. Yeah. yeah. I know. But it just can't gain any traction. If you're watching this and we write about men's volleyball, <laughs> click on it. Just look <laughs> at it for a little while in the spring. <laughs> You know, it's really tough. You know, because you played before um, crowds of, of dozens yeah. when you played. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At you places where you... the front row of Galen Center. Yeah, where you, where you would <laughs> think there would be so many people yeah. interested because the game is so exciting. It really is. It doesn't yeah. translate as well to television. Men's volleyball. Not like a women's game because it's, 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 it's so big and powerful. But when you right. see it in person, you see these kids touching 12 feet. Right. And hitting the living bejesus out of the ball, and then guys dig it yeah, every right. time they dig a ball. I'm like, I when I go back to indoor, I'm always like, whoa! Like, did I? Am I just gone from indoor? So my eyes not used to seeing it move that fast, or like, has the game like evolved since I've been in indoor? Yeah, like, I forget what it's like. And it's so like, when was the last year you played indoor? I played uh, professionally in Puerto was it Puerto Rico last? Yeah, Puerto Rico in 20. 12. Well, seven years is a long time in yeah. the evolution of any sport, but you know, if you go back not that much farther than that, and you think back to how, how, how short of a time ago we didn't have a libero, we didn't have first ball multiple touch, we didn't have guys and women playing the ball with their hands over their head on so many plays. I watched the gold medal yeah. point recently of, uh, was it maybe like 80 Olympics or something when we won the gold? Sorry, I should know that. When we won uh, the U.S. national team won gold, okay, '84, it might have been before that, um, but the gold medal point <laughs> it was like guys are digging it and then they just like standing there ready to set. It, it wasn't like anything, you know. It was, yeah. They were out of system. It was just like stand there and set it straight over to the side, and they were hitting the crap out of them. Those guys were athletic. It was a standing float serve for the gold medal point. I was like, <laughs> this is a lot different than <laughs> <laughs> if you watch it nowadays. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the rally scoring is not as good as surf scoring. Surf scoring is a better game. Mm -hmm. But as somebody who was a club director for 20 years and who puts on volleyball tournaments for girls, I mean, I put on two big tournaments. It's really nice to know that basically within an hour, you're going to get a match finished. Yeah. Right. You know, oh, there's, there's so much to be said for that. But, man, the sport was so exciting. You know, now, if you're down 24-20, once out of 50, 60, 70 times, you might come back. You were down 11 to 2 in, in serve scoring. No sweat. Yeah. It's all cool. We can we chip away at this. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, that's crazy. Yeah. So, and then the libero changed everything. Nets, the ball hitting the net and going over changed everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's in many ways a very different sport. Right. I think the biggest thing for me is first ball multiple hit and playing the ball with your hands uh, up over, the, over your head. Servicing. Yeah, but just the fact that anybody can do that. You, oh, know, right. and, uh, you know, when you when you played like as a kid, mm -hmm. guys didn't play with the ball up up here on right, first right, and right. second balls. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're right. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And probably, and you were a kid when the libero came in. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I want like the beach powers that be to stop watching the indoor game and try. And you look at the FIVB and they're like all the rules changes they're making are trying to emulate the indoor game. I would it would like break my heart if like. You know, overhead touches like became legal if like you could pass with your hands and serve receive like they do an indoor. It my, would kill me. My game personally has evolved based on the rule changes. Like we were talking about the other day, my hand yeah. setting, like I used to be a dish, I used to dish it, mm -hmm. just get it out clean, and I loved it too. You know, you take a lot of pride in having no spin, a nice deep dish coming out clean, but once I got on the world tour and they started calling everything deep and absolutely nothing that's quick up top, I, I just started going. My hands are ugly now, which I used to, I used to take pride yeah. in. Now I I think at least, but it's all just quick. You yeah, know? well, you got to adapt to the rules. Like you remember, three or four years ago, they ruled that it was okay for the setter, and and this was we applied this in girls' club volleyball for the setter to dig the ball out of the net, and if they made contact underneath digging the ball out, really? it was okay. It's lasted for yeah. one year. You're taking out the you know, <laughs> okay, the one, right? Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Now. Think how much time of our lives is spent watching replays in sports, especially in volleyball. Right. They short, sh they fight wars in shorter times now than <laughs> a touch call in a women's game on a replay. 
Oh, you know, <laughs> and it's only going to get better and worse, mm -hmm. depending well, on. Well, now we have the replay system in place. Yes. So that's more commercial time for yeah. uh, for. Uh, but it's working. The replay system, I yeah. would say, it works. Yeah, just for one court, though, right? It's only on yeah, stadium, stadium for bigger events. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, they don't. Do they awesome. have the four stars? Um, I've only ever seen no. it at the major. Yeah. Okay. I've only big ones. Yeah. But it, it's a great system and it works. Yeah. That, that's the thing. Like our sport happens so quick and there's so much bang bang happening. Like there's a lot of missed calls and we're all, you know, programmed to just be like, nope, nope. Yeah. yeah. And then you walk back to the car and touch it. And then you, <laughs> high five and you go search. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's good that, that those calls are being changed. I would like. I would like to see occasionally. Like a player, just I touched it. Come on, give him the point. Everybody saw it. They do, you know. Some people do that, right? Yeah. yeah. There was it. Well, it was pretty funny, and um, something kind of similar happened in Hawaii. I was playing uh, Rosie and Brian Cook in the final round of the qualifier, and they called me on the set. They, the ref said it was a lift, and Rosie like was like, "Dude, that shouldn't have been a lift. Like that set was fine." He told me he's like, "That was a good set," and he was like, "I'm gonna take the point, but that set is fine." <laughs> Knowing that you can't change the call now, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and give you that one. There are guys though who will like, like you'll you'll see them on the world tour where like if a ball is like sort of questionable whether it's in or out, like and they know that like, the ref comes and checks the mark, they'll just call it in. Like you build up some honesty points, so then when you when you like might you know oh, like, yeah. you go off your finger, like, no 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 no, I'm honest. I told you. Right. Game, games, <laughs> I mean, gamesmanship is a big part of sports. Oh, yeah, so no doubt about that. Yeah. yeah. The problem is when the ref lets you dictate it, you know? Some of the veteran players, I feel like refs will like let them talk, or let them take their, oh, well, I don't want to piss off this player, so I'm just gonna kinda let them talk to me and then let them do their own thing. And, I mean, really, they're just using and abusing the ref and the rules. Well, that was like, uh, you know, one of my favorite books was called The Jordan Rules. <laughs> it's all about Michael Jordan. Oh, yeah, for you can, sure. There's, you know, double entendre there. Uh -huh. The Jordan rules, yeah. or the Jordan rules. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it's like Tom Brady too, right? Yeah, uh -huh. Brady got his some a few rules changed in his favor. Yeah, absolutely. It's a tough rule now. Like anybody, if you look at Brady the wrong way, and he goes down from yeah. the passer <laughs> below the knees, but that was basically him, right? Because yeah. he got rolled up on. Meanwhile, back to volleyball. Yeah. dot com. No, I mean, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you guys did buy it, though, like, uh, what was the mindset when you you bought it? You were like, okay, well, like now what? Type day, like, did you look at it as a, like a, a viable business thing, or were you was this just like because you mentioned you just like had a lot of fun writing these stories and like you were starting Destination Volleyball? I can't imagine you'd be like, I'm gonna start this to make millions in media because like you look at two two ventures that a business right. called vvshots.com mm -hmm. where I'm try, sure Try has bought plenty of pictures of himself from you and if he has any shit it's still vvshots.com but yeah so we you know I gave up the destination volleyball.com and vvshots.com got m merged into volleyballmag.com and so there it was and like I said we our, our goal and we agreed upon this was we were going to try to make it a daily digital news source about volleyball yeah so we started with we launched our new website which was just fabulous right before the 2016 Olympics. And I never imagined that my life for two weeks was gonna consist of three TVs, a laptop, an iPad on, basically you know, 18 hours a day. I watched every single beach and indoor men's and women's match of the 2016 Olympics. Every match. Every single Not one. Not every American match. Every match. Wow. And I recorded, I took notes all day, and then I would wake up, crack the dawn, or that night, or whatever I had energy for, and then I would write up the stories, and that's how we covered the Olympics. And then he you know, he, he jumped in on you know, some of the stuff, and I don't remember if we had other people helping us. And I remember just thinking when it was over, wait, this is done, and now NCAA women's season's about to start? <laughs> yeah. Oh. So what I do there... As you know, I look at every single NCAA women's box score every single day. I do the same thing for the men's during the, during the spring because I don't want to miss one important match or one phenomenal performance. There's that kid who gets 37 kills and he just, you right. know, for East Jackass Flat State year, and you have no idea <laughs> who this was. And if you don't follow it, that, you know, you don't, want, you don't want to be that. So then, you know, of course, we, we, we did feature stories and, um, you know, Ed jumped in. Ed had never been a writer 
you know, and my joke with him is, as a photographer, he, as a writer, he was a really good photographer. Yeah. But it's a craft that he's had to learn and, and right. gotten very Still good Still not at. a writer. No, but, but, <laughs> but he had never interviewed people with the idea that, um, well, I'm not only going to like feed a quote to somebody, wait, I'm going to save all these quotes to write stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've had tremendous response to some of the stories. And he's done now college um, indoor uh, stories, but you know, mostly on the, be the beach stuff. You know, re really good stuff. But so the second year, or maybe later that spring, so let's see, we took over in 16, so it might have been, the, must have been the spring of 17. And I got, I drove to uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama in May to cover the NCAA Women's Beach Championships, which I love. It was a super event. And that site is yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's great. No, it's good. And um, a friend of mine named Kyle Blackburn, who lives in Baton Rouge, or now has moved, but uh, head coach volleyball Baton Rouge for me, and is a beach guy who Travis knows, he calls me and he says, have you seen this website called Paper Courts? And this guy <laughs> Travis who's writing. And I said, no. And I had flipped on my computer. I'm in the, the media tent there. And I flip it on and I read it and I went, this is incredibly good stuff. I, I sent a, an email to the address there and I said, call me. And a few minutes later, Travis B. Werger called me. <laughs> and I said, you're going to work for me. And he's like, you know, who are you? Whatever, you know. And I said, you know, and so we exchanged stories and I said, you know, you started writing stuff for us. Yeah. And I told Ed it would be just a matter of time before we lost you. Well, if you remember too, that, that year you started doing stuff for uh, a major media outlet like Yahoo or somebody. You yeah, know, you did a bunch of stuff like uh, mainstream football and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. but every once in a while he'd come back and he'd still be doing stuff with us. And then somewhere along the line we started Sandcast, and then P fourteen forty came calling, which was, you know, great opportunity. Yeah. So the single best part about the merger was, well, you know, the money was good, but um, <laughs> you know, but was you know I said well we get Travis back. So you know you're finally able to write stuff for volleyball come full circle. and we're able to put things on both websites and it's really good. I mean. This guy is a, is a really good sports writer and a good writer in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've written some you know, unbelievable stuff. I and mean, when when you get a little emotional and corny, it's even better. But <laughs> I, not, not tonight, thank you. But you know, but you know what I'm saying, Try. Totally. I mean, the guy, the guy's good. Oh, yeah, yeah. And sure. uh, you know, one of the, I heard you wrote a book. One of these days, I need to yeah. read, read it. Okay. Um, but so that was just one of the things that happened. Yeah. You know, along the way, we've got other people. We've got two former editors of Volleyball Magazine, Mike Miazga who lives in Chicago, and Megan Kaplan who lives in Austin, who both yeah. write for us. And we've got other people circulated around the country. Chris Tobolsky used to be at FrontVolleyball.com, has now picked up juniors and high school coverage for us. And um, We've got a guy named Guilherme Torres who lives in uh, Columbus, Ohio, who's Brazilian, whose English is unbelievable and is starting to cover Brazilian stuff for us. And his first story was fascinating. He wrote about a men's player named uh, you're gonna have to help me here. Liao, Yoandi Liao, who's from Cuba, but has joined the Brazilian men's indoor team. Ah. And what he did was he, he interviewed him by Skype in Portuguese and wrote the story in English, but used the video interview in Portuguese on the story. So we can try to appeal to both audiences because the Brazil volleyball passion Oh, and number of people is so big. Mm -hmm. Now he he's did he did something on the uh, women's team, and he's got more things coming. And of course, you know, in beach volleyball is just crazy um, the, the way they're churning out. I mean, they oh, can, yeah. they could go one, two, three, and you know, both sides yeah. next summer in Tokyo. It's you know, you could they're crazy. The last part was even crazy. Well, they can only go one, yeah. two, right? Because only two countries. Two. Yeah, they can right. only go one, right. two. Yeah, yeah, but they they could conceivably. Totally. You know, although I don't. I can see it happening on the women's side. I think in the men's side, it's going to be pretty pretty darn hard right now to beat either the Norwegians or the Germans. And the Russians. Which Russians? Krasilnikov and the world champs. Awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. world champs and world champs. If you had to put money on the, besides your team. Um, you already knew my answer. Yeah. <laughs> team, no, um, uh, the, the, two guys from, the two guys from Norway. Yeah, you, you know. would be stupid not to put money, your money on Norway. For sure, but yeah. I honestly like would not just look at world champs. You know? yeah. They do have less experience than yeah. a lot of these other teams, and when it comes down to it, and you are the favorite by far, and you're supposed to go in it, you know things change. You Veterans guys, yeah. can uh, can do oh. things in the moment that that can change things for people who haven't been there before. I think you've probably addressed this maybe on the show, and you know I, I need I, I'm hoping the two of you even write about this more, but. On the United States side, where does it stack up right now? Who gets? Who's going to be the two teams? Who's in the lead? How, who, who would be? You know, is anybody a leader in the clubhouse at this point? 
I think if like if you look at it, me and Try kind of talked about it earlier. Where at the, maybe the halfway point of the summer, it would be as if like Try and Trevor were six under par, and like, Phil and Nick were two under, and Jake and Taylor were even. Where like it's a nice lead to have, but like you're just two days in, so it didn't really mean anything. Right. It didn't mean a whole lot. And then now I think it's pretty much like because I averaged it out where if if everybody were to have twelve finishes that it's basically they're almost in the exact same spot. It's like a dead tie between those three. And, like, there's only really three men's team in the race, whereas, like, everybody else kind of dropped off. Whereas the women's side, you have April and Alex, who, like, it would take, like, something drastic or, like, really bad for them not to be in the Olympics. And then you have, like, four teams who, like, have a pretty legit shot at that second spot. So the women's race is, like, kind of, is like, insane for how deep it is, whereas the guys, it's just, like, a three-horse race. So what do you got to do? How many you got to Get win? better at volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I Get more medals. Well, <coughs> number one, I got to stay healthy. That's That's been right. the main thing. Um, but I meant in terms of, like, you, do you have to win? Do you have to just so finish it's, good? It's, it's, a point, it's a points race, which yeah. is kind of boring, I think. Um, but, yeah, so it's your best It's your best 12 finishes right. from this whole past season to all until up until June 2020. And uh, I think that's about, there's about seven events out. I, I got to see the schedule, but it's not out yet. It's not official, and it always changes. But there'll be about seven events. Nothing in America. Nothing in America, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, it's all about points. Basically, whoever has the highest average finish is, is going to go. And right now, it's a three-horse race, so two of the three are going to go. Same thing as last squad. Uh, Hyde and I ended up being the third team, but it was really between... Nick and Phil, Jake and Casey, Hyden and I, um, but I won't be in that position this time around. See, in in swimming, in track and field, for example, you can miss going to the Olympics by one one hundredth of a second in an event mm-hmm. because they have trials, right? And um, it's part of it. You can get sick that day. And it, 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 it happens. Yeah. But in beach volleyball, it, it's the damnedest thing. You don't have trials. It's just this year-long, um, you know, lifetime achievement award for the last three years. Yeah, you know, right. picking up. And I personally have problems with that. I would rather see a tournament, an FIVB-style tournament. I mean, can I get on my soapbox now about you know a non-beach guy watching the beach and trying to understand? No, I the AVP is stacked. Okay, I think the AVP has done a fantastic job. The, the Amazon Prime is great. Right. I love what they're doing. Yeah. And uh, you know, Barney. And Cameron Irwin, they, they, they just do such a great job. Um, I love the freeze rule. I think that's a fantastic thing that they put in. But I don't like the fact that the top four teams basically get to sit back and and watch people beat their brains out for two days before they really have to do anything. And it's so unfair that nobody, I say nobody, a, you know, a 1 in 15 shot has a chance of coming out of the qualifier and even getting to Saturday, it seems like. Yeah. You know? Because, and the, the the wear and tear, whatever. All right, so that's my soapbox. So what I love about the big FIVB majors is that there's pool play. Just yeah. girls, juniors. You got you to play, you got to play everybody, and then your success or failure, equal for everybody up and down the, the, the field, determines whether you get to the next round. Right. Not because you just did well previously and you're sitting there waiting, you know? Mm-hmm. And at the end of the season, I'd be curious to know how many times, like, Phil and Nick had a jump this year compared to Travis, you know. Yeah. In, you know, think about how many times you just had a jump and swing on Thursdays. Yeah. You know, compared yeah. to them playing, oh, well, we won. How are we going? That's good. Thank. We got there late. We won. Okay, let's go. What do you want, what do you want to have dinner? <laughs> let's watch some video. Get, get a good night's sleep. You know. To be I'm fair, not Nick and Phil are jumping on Thursdays for FIVBs and then flying overseas. Right. To get back to the AVPs, which is a whole other story. Isn't it the other way around normally? It seems like on Sundays, people finish here and then they're sprinting the from airport. an AVP event to an yeah. airport to go fly to Moscow or someplace, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's all. And, and you know, Phil and Nick, I'm not, I'm not riding on you guys. I'm just using it as an example. You know? They love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I will say, like, from my standpoint, I look at it and, like, they've earned that spot to be relaxing. And that's just kind of the like to relax and that's just kind of the way it is i do love like for a 2014 girl i think modified pool would be the best way to do it 
Because you look at it, so I, this has happened to me twice in a row in Hermosa, where I've won my first main draw match, moved forward to play a team who got a bye, then I lost, and it's I go back to as if I had lost my first match. I didn't move forward at all. I just like move yeah, forward, and move back, and then move over back. Same place. And yeah. I look at it, I'm like, damn, like now I got to play these guys who like have been off for like eight hours because they lost their first match, and like they've been resting, and then like you know I just got pounded by Ed and Rafu, so I just, you know, <laughs> like. So I, I think a 24-team draw, modified pool play would be great. But like 32-teamers, there's no buys. 16-teamers, uh, there's no buys. Just the 24-teamers, it's kind of a strange deal. But to your point about Olympic trials, we there was an Olympic trial in 96. And this is if you talk to Randy Stoklos and Adam Johnson about it, they will say that no Olympic trials ever. Because in their, so their qualifying match, Randy Stoklos was hitting a warm-up serve, landed on the ball, and sprained his ankle and like pretty much couldn't jump in that match lost and then had like the next was in the loser's bracket had another shot to qualify but his ankle was like mm -hmm. toast and then lost to Karch and Kemp so and, but I think if like him and Adam had played you know for two years on the FIVB or whatever we probably made it because like they were really good have you ever had Adam on this we have because he, he coaches girls club volleyball yeah, down in Austin. Club in Austin and I met him on the circuit and over the years in a visit with him. It's too bad he's short on opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what an interesting fellow, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was a good player. Yeah, so really good D D oh, go ahead. Well, I think the system... I think it'd be better for our sport to have the trials. You know, it's more exciting. It's something for our fans to watch. And more importantly, it will get those top four teams you're talking about home for all the AVPs. Yeah. Now we don't have to rely on on the world tour to decide who goes to the Olympics. Now we own that as the U.S. and we can give our U.S. fan base that value. Uh, and I think, for me, it's it's like depressing. I feel like I haven't played on the MVP tour. I've never played full season except for my first year on tour. And uh, even when, I mean, me and Hayden won team of the year in 2015 and we didn't even play in all the events. We had won, I think we had won the most or something. So we won that, but like, the rankings and like what fans are seeing on the AVP is never real, mm -hmm. like the stats or anything, because half the team or all the top teams ha weren't even there. So if someone has 100 blocks and other guy and one of the top guys has 60, well, the, that top guy had three blocks per set just to get to that 60, but the other guy played three times yeah. as many sets, so he's gonna have more blocks. And I think that kind of stuff is confusing for our fans. And if we can own that Olympic. Um, value like the entertainment value of that. Well, I mean, I like when huge. you watch the U.S. Olympic track and field trials or the U.S. Olympic swimming trials or in any sport, it's it's gripping. Usually, yeah, it can be tougher than the Olympics. It's not fair though, and it's not necessarily going to get our best team to the Olympics. I will say that because anyone can win one event. Not anyone can be a top ranked team on the world tour, and, and it's been proven over the last yeah. however long. Like, since I've been on tour, there's been certain individuals who have been in the main draw the whole time, and certain individuals who have been trying to get there, and they can't. And if you can't, pr you can't even make a main draw or prove that you can get on the podium once throughout a season, then you're probably not going to go get the U.S. A, a medal at the Olympics. But you could earn that spot. Well, the one thing, too, in, in, in your sport that nobody else has to contend with is the weather. Yeah, right. You know, totally. the, the wind can make volleyballs do strange things. So oh, yeah. I would I would suggest that if we ever get, did go back to Olympic trials for beach volleyball, that it be conducted indoors in a big arena. I think that would be really right. cool. I think I would That's say a, my dream like trial system is just have the AVP season be your trial. That would be amazing. So you'd have, mm -hmm. say, eight events. I'll bet the ABU would like that. You, yeah. have, you have to stay together as a team. It's like similar to how Hawaii was seated this year, where your main draw is seated off of your points in the Gold Series as a main draw team. Um, so you have teams that can stand together. So you can get behind a team, not everybody's like switching up. And the Olympic race is at home. So like you go to Manhattan Beach, which is late in the year, and you have, say, four teams in the Olympic race. Well, now the stakes are like, a lot higher than just, I mean, your name on the pier is one thing, but name on the pier and an Olympic race, mm -hmm. then you have a whole nother thing. Now you like capture not just the beach volleyball market, but you might get tap into that Olympic market too. That, that's the key right there, I think, is, is having the AVP be, our domestic tour be the Olympic race.
problem is you have to get USA Volleyball on board, and their funding comes from the USOC. So the USOC has to be on board in terms of, is this the best way to get us medals? And we still want our players playing on the World Tour, because that's what they want. They want that international success. Well, that's where the money is, too. You make so, so much more money if you right. finish high in an FIVB event. Well, well kind of AVP now it's money is pretty good. It's like it's an AVP is like bigger than a four star money wise. That's good. Yeah, the World Tour yeah. is, is weak right now. And the AVP is like getting really AVP's strong. Great. Yeah. We'd rather stay home. To be and honest. there's the issue of the ball, too, because that oh. Mombasa <laughs> right. is way different than yeah, Wilson. Right. For sure. Right. And everybody likes the Wilson. Yeah, so I was. <laughs> 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 So that's what I would love to see. The, I think a big obstacle with that would be to get the FIVB on board. Because you, you have need to be on board. They, they don't need to be. You know, you yeah. know whatever the USOC well, the I, says. I, well, well, Brazil, the IRC, Brazil does their own thing. But Brazil still has to earn their two spots. They in do the it big, through the world tour. Through the world tour. So we would still have to earn our yeah. spots through yeah. the world tour. Right. The individual company country can decide who the two entrants are. If so, you have to have your two teams, like two teams ranked in the top 20, 16 or top 25 on the world tour to assure your country two spots. Top 15. Okay, top 15. So we would still need teams to be doing, performing on the world tour in order to say have the AVP season as our Olympic. Do you see why I say all the time beach volleyball is like herding cats? Right. <laughs> so many people yeah. and, and how they'll end up being part of the that conversation. I'm sure you, <laughs> okay, so you cannot. How many of you had as a pro? Two. Just two? Just you and. I'm dedicated. Wow. Pick them good and stick with them. Good. Yeah. yeah. My baby beer this is like three pages long. <laughs> well, well, when I started, actually, I guess I had like uh, a few guys, but that's like trying to break in, you know? Yeah. It's a little different. Yeah. If I got scooped by hiding, I'd probably cling on him. Too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't planning on breaking up with him after 2016. <laughs> well, you had the nerve to get sick. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling? Yeah. You good? I've been good, yeah. Finally, well, yeah, finally feeling good. I was just starting to feel good. Uh, By the way, I hadn't seen you in a long time because Travis well, and I talk on the phone a lot and we email and text with each other. But yeah, it's quite the since since I'm out here, I'll say that's quite the gnarly beard. Yeah, you know, and, yeah, um, good California, yeah, except for the, one, the the hole on the side over there. What's up with that? Right, you know, the, I know I have some random patches missing. I know, so, yeah. but Delaney likes the beard, so the beard stays. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> scruffy, scruffy. <laughs> Um, um, Ed, with you, like, with sports photography, kind of circling back. Oh, yeah, yeah, with volleyballmag.com. Yes. How, <laughs> how do you get into, like, one, sports photography in general, but, you know, because you grew up in Northern California, um, and then how did you kind of narrow that focus into volleyball and, like, beach volleyball, I feel like, is kind of where your passion really lies? So, yeah, I've, I've been a big volleyball fan since 1976. And in 1978, I went to this enormous grass volleyball tournament, the Berkeley Open, probably over 150 nets. And I thought, this tournament is really cool. Wouldn't it be great to have some photos of this? So I walked about four blocks to a local camera shop, picked up a Canon or a Pentax K1000 and a Solar Gore lens, and shot volleyball just randomly. You know, I used my parents' cameras before. But that was the first time I had owned a camera and kept shooting ever since. And I owned a volleyball facility up in Sacramento for a few years. So that gave me something that always shoot and right. people love seeing their pictures. Yeah. So I did that for a long time before moving down here. And then, of course, this is heaven for beach volleyball. Yeah. So you just kind of went, went from there? Yeah, just kept shooting. Did you go to school for photography or did you just like, is it all self-taught? Uh, it's pretty much self-taught other than, you know, an eighth grade photography class. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And nowadays on the internet, you can, you know, you can learn a lot by seeing, seeing how other people work. Yeah. Um, there, there are no secrets. You know, you can reverse engineer a photo, see where people are setting up, right. how they're shooting, yeah. and so on. You were in the business world. Yeah. yeah. Real estate broker. Not ah. that fun. Uh -huh. Well, you fit in the beach volleyball world just fine then, because after beach volleyball, everyone just gets into real estate. It's just kind of the way it goes. So. Yeah, I guess I <laughs> went the other way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Reversed it. What are some of the highlights of, of your career? It's, it's interesting to me that you've been around it for so long. That's like a really unique perspective that you, that you bring. 
So one was Beijing 2008. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't credentialed, um, but there's down in one corner of the arena, there was this really loud bank of speakers. And it was right in front of the really expensive corporate seats in the first row. So people could not sit there for three hours. Right, you right. just could not, I mean. But, so they always moved somewhere else. So I could always go shoot there, you know, and I'd buy the cheapest seats I could find from some Chinese scalper. You know, <laughs> and I would work my way down, you know, seven rows at a time in order right. not to get busted and kicked out. Uh -huh. So I got to that front row and I could cheat there the whole time. And I, um, Phil, Phil and Todd were in a third set against Brazil. I made an amazing comeback. I think they were down 11-4 or something. Right. Like third. And then Phil put on a blocking clinic on Marcio and he pretty much retired right then. <laughs> um, but, and I have a great shot of him over and just stuffing Marcio and the balls, Marcio can see the ball down in his chest and that's my favorite photo. For yeah. Sure, so. Those photos I've seen of that Olympic Games was like, Phil was just an absolute freak of nature. He was getting up so high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like now you can you can kind of see it with Anders gets up like that, but like Phil, young Phil was ridiculous mm -hmm. how high he was getting. Like, and and that was in a period where there weren't that many people, people that didn't know had how to play that against kind of that, for presence. sure. When I first yeah. came out, I didn't know how to play against that. So I first came out, I was hitting the normal shots. And it's like, that wasn't supposed to be within your reach. Okay, I'll just go over. Oh, you can swap that too. Okay, I guess I have to change my entire game. But now there's a bunch of them, like you said. And back then, I can't imagine like guys dominating the tour, and then Phil comes out, and you're just like, you just can't play the same style of volleyball anymore because he's such a freak. Yeah. Every year, we, I get Ed to do his, the, you know, his top ten favorite photos mm -hmm. and beach photos, and he puts them together at the end of the year, and it's really spectacular. Yeah. Uh, but but there's two photos in particular that we've run and, and used. One was a Penn State uh, winning a national championship. And there's a couple photos around at the penultimate moment of the celebration, and you look at them and you go, those are really good photos. But Ed's is just that much better. And it, it's it's just a little bit, well, you look at it and you go, wow, our picture is so much better than their picture. And then there's a picture of Stanford winning last year that there's a, there's a picture out there that shows Catherine Plummer coming in from the left and she's jumping in all the emotions. The picture's almost identical. But Ed's picture has Catherine Plummer a split second after that with her ponytail flying up in the air. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the picture and you go, wow, this picture's so much better than the other picture. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff that he does. But how many pictures do you shoot in an average AVP weekend? Probably... 10,000, 10, 000, 10 oh, to 12,000. I put the over under at 2,000. Holy cow. Yeah. That's so many. And then you gotta like edit it. Pick what? Well, I, I try to clean them up as much as I can. I right. usually go home with about 3,000. Okay. I'll process around 1,500 and around 900. We'll get to my website if ever. Right. <laughs> okay, all right. Wow. So, so you guys talking about Phil um, and the first volleyball match beach volleyball that I ever went to outside of like just going to Mangos in Baton Rouge. Yeah. We, we were in Berlin on vacation. Brenda and I went to uh, Berlin for a few days and we were taking a little boat tour. You know, you've been to Berlin probably. Yeah, I'm hoping yeah. you're talking about your first win, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this been like 11, 12 years ago? Wouldn't have been that long. No, no, no. 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 Yeah. So. 2014 I played in Berlin. Oh, it was way before that. I mean, the, the boat goes around this curve in the river and I said to her and it was cool boat tour you could drink beer and stuff on the boat you know yeah. watch the stuff and it's just it's a river in the city and I said to her volleyball she goes what and I said listen and, you know there's a cadence to volleyball whistles oh, she yeah. goes you're right and we come around the corner and there set on the banks of this river is a big FIVB volleyball tour I didn't know anything about it so anyway the boat goes back and I get back in, in the hotel and I'm looking at the internet and I go oh there's a big beach tour here tomorrow I mean tomorrow's the finals you want to go and it was just the women's final and the men's final. And she was like, yeah, let's go, you know. I mean, Brenda was a big time volleyball coach. She yeah. never played beach, but, and I had never seen a beach room. So we, we go, and it was free. We walk right in, and you get these amazing seats. Everyone saw all the Germans. <laughs> well, it's the biggest. Wait, oh, so can you give me tickets? It's, it's the biggest mistake that's ever made. 
Yeah. How, how great can it be there? Yeah, but that's what, that's, <laughs> right, that's right? the biggest mistake the father right. ever made. Well, well they're still missing so there's you know, gotta be a reason. It should have been, even if it cost a quarter. It's because they're know? scared not to have a stands filled. Well, so I we think. watch, and I remember being so impressed with uh, Phil, who was a, a new, a, you know, a new face on the on the on yeah. in the sport at that time. I think at that level. Totally. And then I got to watch Kerry Walsh Jennings and Misty May play, and I think they beat a Chinese pair in the final. And I will tell you, I've covered, I've covered everything. Okay, I've been lucky enough as a sports writer. I mean, I've covered it, the NBA at the highest levels, you know, Major League Baseball, the NFL, I've seen international soccer. She acted out last Mis- year. Yeah, I mean, I, we tell that whole story another time. But uh-huh. Misty May is among the most spectacular Jordan-esque athletes I have ever seen in person. Her ability to fall down in the sand and get back up at a high level faster than any, it, it's, it, was, it was incredible. Did you ever get to play like nearby and see her play? Or yeah, her she, but she was kind of like dipping in every once in a while, post kids, just because she could. Mm. Like, yeah. not, not yeah. like legit I, 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 I got to watch it. It was, she, she was the most explosive, yeah. fast switch muscle fiber. Now, her partner wasn't bad. She <laughs> <laughs> was pretty damn good, yeah. you know, and, but, but a different position and a different body type. Yeah. And Misty, I've never forgiven her for costing us at least two indoor gold medals by turning to the beach. She was <laughs> that good. Yeah. She was that good. If you never seen, if you didn't see her play at Long Beach State, and you've never seen the videos, I'm telling you, she was a one-person wrecking crew. And on the, I, I remember just thinking it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen, um, because I was just so taken aback by it. I mean, I'd seen Michael Jordan play, and I would put her athletically in that category. Yeah. You know, and then. Um, since we're not on a time frame here, I can just... So afterwards, the match ends, and it was like, this, you know how they make those beach complexes, and right across is a train station. I love European train stations. They're That's where we play, yeah, right yeah. in front of the train right. station. And I said to Brenda, I said, let's go to the train station, because I want to look around, and I need to use, use the restroom anyway. So we go over there, and uh, um, we come out of the bathrooms, and in the train station is where they're doing the post-match news conference, yeah. in the train station. And we walk over, and there's two um, interviewers talking to Carrie and Misty, who would immediately, you know, they take their, you know, wraps, and so they had their, you know, like, right. kind of dressed up for the interview. Yeah. And Misty was asked a question about um, liking coming to Berlin, and she gave some answer, and the interviewer wanted more, and looked at her, and Misty goes, and world peace. <laughs> <laughs> and we busted out laughing, me and Brenda, but nobody else laughed because nobody else got it, right? And Carrie looks down at us and goes, you American? And uh, it's like, yeah. So afterwards, they came over and we visited and we turned out we had a lot of mutual friends and stuff from volleyball and meet, met with them. And for my TV show, they actually cut a promo that was really funny, Carrie and Missy did. And uh, that was my first pro beach volleyball tournament. Not a bad yeah, intro. Yeah, it was pretty funny. We had a great get conversation. Get the team in so, history of team sports. And they were so <laughs> funny. You know? They were so good for the sport, not only because of their ability. Like, I mean, you take Phil, his physical ability and, and his dominance, you could you could compare the two. But what they did off the court mm-hmm. and the, the level that they reached as American professional athletes, like, that raised their sport so much. Mm. Well, you know... I, I've been around Kerry under a lot of different circumstances long before we became part of P1440 um, at, at NCAA Final Fours at uh, the beach championships for the NCAA and she's tireless in visiting with kids right. and, and women and posing for selfies and signing autographs and just being so nice and, and not just an ambassador to the, for the sport but just as a nice person and that goes such a long way. There's a lot of athletes out there who can just be such dicks, and they don't have to be. Yeah, you know, because that li- that one little kid, you know, that you can influence in a positive way. And um, I, I can't say that. I mean, I assume Misty was the same way, but I just haven't been around her as mm-hmm. much under those circumstances. Um, but you know, Carrie, I mean, I mean unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So. I think a, a big part of it is just kind of educating the the players on the business side of things or, or the media side of things and understanding what our sport is off of the court because I, I never really got that introduction I just came out and I figured I, if I win then all this stuff comes to me and <laughs> but then I realized like no you kind of have to create it you have to go get an agent who 
uh, or you, you don't need an agent, but you have to create value for yourself. Create create value for the sponsors. They don't just show up and say, "Here, yeah. wear a hat." Like here's a bunch of money. You have to actually bring <laughs> value to the table. <laughs> well, you know the thing is too that as as a sports writer talking to an athlete, you know, be a good post match media interview. Mm-hmm. When I talk to you on the in between days, you know, just be honest, have fun, right. enjoy it, and then afterwards. You know, don't be in a big hurry when a, when a sporting event is over. A kid wants your autograph. People want to shake your hand. They want to do it. You know, just that's part of it, right? Yeah. I think people need to understand that that's part of what right. we're doing. And sometimes you lose, and you're in a crappy mood, but you, you should still be nice. Yeah. You know, and you can yeah. take your 10, 5, 10 minutes, but then come back and, and get that in. You know, exactly. Like those people showed up, and that's what our sport needs: is people to show up and be entertained. And mm-hmm. if they want just an autograph or a high five or you know something like that, then. I think that's our duty to. Yeah. To well, give one them. thing college women's teams do, indoor teams, is almost everybody's got athlete signing periods afterwards. So state right. U plays at home, win, lose, or draw. Girls, as soon as this match is over, the tables are going out, the posters are there, and you guys got the sharpies. And no matter what happens, there's a couple hundred little girls who, who line up in their families and they want to, you know, shake hands, take a picture, sign the autograph. The World Tour does a good job of that by having a media section, like when you play. On Getting their inter- everyone's getting their interviews, but then the fans line up right outside of the mix and all this. And, and I think the tournament kind of tells them to meet there, or it's just where the athletes come out. But I think that's important too, is for the tour to kind of facilitate those opportunities for the fans to engage and for the media. Because I'm sure it's hard to chase people down. Like if I'm pissed off, uh, yeah. Ed might not catch me. Like I might be gone and I'm hiding somewhere because I don't want. To be well, that's where that's where relationships and reputations come in. Like um, totally. you know, like uh. I was in Japan mm-hmm. for the pre-Olympic tournament, and uh, there were a couple people who lost, but they were like, and I, I think I'm giving myself credit I deserve here, it's like, <laughs> all right, he's all, he's come all the way here, he's interviewed me in the past, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, I know I'm going to get a good question, you know, so. Right, you know. totally. And okay. like, you or get their phone number, number. like, yeah. Ed can text me. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> did, we did that. It's a small yeah, sport, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And if you like, don't um, burn athletes in your stories. That, that goes a long way too. Yeah. I'm just like, well, I mean, I hope people if they ever read anything that we've done, no matter what the circumstances, they think it was, yeah. you know, fair and accurate, and yeah. you know, and, uh, and and an honest assessment of things. And you know, we don't overly assess anyway. I mean, you know, you win, you lose. You know, whatever. that's actually an interesting thing that that I want to bring up is, I feel like in volleyball, we a lot of times we don't dig up the dirt quite as much, and I don't know if it's like you don't want to step on people's toes and not get interviews or. You know, later on the line, but there's a lot of like dirt in there sometimes that I think is really interesting. And a lot of I mean, you look on TV and it's like, look what Antonio Brown did, he's an idiot. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we don't have like the, the well, analysts like that. Yeah, well, the one thing we have, like, for example, again, back to the women's indoor, we have statistics, we have sports information directors, and we have it, all the information in our hands. So I can say, you know, little Janie had 20 kills, but she only hit 065, and then in the fifth set, she was terrible. You know, right. and you can notate that. Uh-huh. Whereas with you guys, you know, the match goes by, unless you're like charting it yourself, you're not gonna, right. you're not gonna get any kind of numbers, for mm-hmm. example. And, you know, it's just the nature of the game. It's just so, and there's only two people, it's so, it's so right. much different. But as far as the social... Like I should be grilled for, for what I did in, in no, the yeah, right. That's true, right, right? Someone should grill me, but yeah. I'm the only one up here telling everyone about it like an idiot. Right, right. To uh, you know, like put yourself like in the in the case of like uh, the Am- the Amazon Prime Network where Kevin Barnett and Cameron Irwin are right. there, you know, they can be critical or analytically critical, but only to a point because a they're there for the whole tournament, they're there for all eight tournaments, and then win, lose, or draw, they're going to want to have conversations with right. you, exactly. and so you you've got to know that line. But I think any athlete will respect fair criticism. If you point out factual things again, like totally. um, you know, uh, player X Y Z hit into the net four of the last five times he swung, and that's why they lost the match. Mm-hmm. That's a fact. Right? Now, they might get angry that you analyze it that way, like how you know why, but, but that's okay. You Do you know? think our sport maybe would would benefit from having? I think what I'm referring to in, in ESPN and all that is is these analysts whose job is to take a side and then allow the audience to either agree or disagree mm. you know and, and that kind of riles everyone well, up about it have you, have you been on Bali Talk? <laughs> <laughs> no I do not do the, the blogs but I think yeah, that would be entertaining yeah. right? somewhat like if there's really be interesting I'd recommend and Travis kind of laid it out there a few times which I liked I was like oh this guy's telling me how it is 
Yeah. I'd recommend for you to just get healthy and still try to make the Olympics right now. <laughs> no, no, see, I, mean, I love everybody. everybody. I'm not trying to be that guy. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why that. that I mean, I, I see that a lot. Oh, like, I mean, uh, the last couple times I've interviewed Carrie, mm -hmm. she snapped at me because she didn't like the questions, and she'd be the first one we joke about it, right? You know, but I appreciate the fact that mm -hmm. you know, sure. Um, you know, and Barnett, I think, probably does the best job of being openly critical in a fair way. Because I remember when I watched a match that I had on stadium court uh, that he was commentating he was like Travis's jump serve is not effective at and but the fans are like, engaged yeah right. Right. Com. I mean there's been a, a few of them that have come and gone you know to begin now with now we're kind of it yeah. yeah and now it's like 14, and, and then the same yeah, you, you can follow yeah. the mag so. right and with the net live retiring there's one volleyball podcast of, of significance mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Coach Brains out yeah, yeah, yeah. is, but they're indoor too. So and they, like, and they're they, good, and they're sporadic. Yeah, right. you know, you guys are cranking it out every single Wednesday, no matter what. There's something, and it's awesome. And it's hard, but uh, yeah. So unfortunately, you know, there's not that many media outlets. Right, you're stuck with us. But, <laughs> but, um, but on the other hand, you know, we're, we're covering it hard. You know, yeah. so well, and we're you know, we're in it. You know, yeah. that's the good thing about like. Travis is a writer, or he was a writer first, but like you've completely immersed yourself in it. You're actually like pursuing, like climbing the rankings and doing yeah. it. Yeah. But like that perspective that you have, you have so much more credibility because you're on the court at the tournaments, yeah. you know, in the players' tents. Well, and it, it, it gets the same way, you know, because yeah, he's been exactly. in the sport for all these years. I mean, I'm a latecomer to it, even though, mm -hmm. I mean, I was a 20 year club director and a mainstream sports writer. I mean, I was the LSU basketball beat writer for a long time. And, you know, written a few books and all this, so I bring at least a journalistic sports credibility to it. You know, you can question my my volleyball analysis if you want, but not my passion for it. You know, yeah. You know. But yeah, so so you know, all of you are lucky that you've got us. You know, <laughs> right. you know so. it's all about the yin and yang, right? Like this show wouldn't be anything if I didn't have Travis, who actually has the journalist background. Mm -hmm. Or else it'd just be me and maybe some other athlete just like talking and people would be like, I can't listen to this. Like, <laughs> the conversation's <laughs> all over the place and blah, blah, blah. I think you do like undersell like what you bring to the table though because athletes are so comfortable because you're there. Mm -hmm. And I know at least at first I think like now that like you said, like I have like become like a le pretty legitimate player in the sport that they're a little bit more comfortable like right. talking to me too, but like, you know, like April Ross and Phil and Kame in our first like five episodes, it would have never happened right. if it was just like, Hey, Bill, I'm a journalist. So, like, yeah. love it. lose 21 9 first round of qualifying. They're definitely doing my favorite. All right, Travis. Yeah, let's, let's yeah but to your credit, too, the, the, the people that you guys have come on, Sandcast, come and they're wide open. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're open. And, and, and I think that is what they, yeah. Tribe brings. Yeah, and they tell good stories. And you have, and you have, you know, you're a good interview. You ask good questions. I always find it fascinating about um, the stuff that happens off the court and the lifestyle things that athletes have to deal with. And you guys get, get them to talk about yeah. that. I mean, you know, whether it's diet or travel or yeah. their social lives and stuff, and that, that stuff's pretty fun. That's what I wanted, because yeah. I was having these conversations with these athletes overseas, and, you know, I was bored. It's like, this is value right here. Like, people want to know about this stuff in yeah. our sport, yeah. so yeah. how can we do it? But, I mean, I mean, you guys have the same thing, that kind of yin and yang. Like, he's been around the sport. It's kind of funny, you'd like... We feel, you know, players were like in it and we're always there. And I feel like we feel like we know so much about the sport. But if you really look at it, like, we've only been here for like, he's been here for a few years. I've been here for like, what, seven years or something. You've been like following the sport since you understand it from the outside, from the media perspective, from the business perspective, probably. That's something that I think all the players could benefit from learning more about. I'm trying to learn more, but. Yeah. Well, it's it for, my, for me, you know. I had never, my first pro beach volleyball tournament was covering for Volleyball Magazine about five years ago in New Orleans, which set some kind of three-day record for rain or something. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was the first time I'd ever been around it. And I remember thinking there's so many elements here that are so weird, not the least of which was as soon as the final was over, athletes were sprinting. To, and, and changing in the limousine yeah. that they had set up for him to get to the New Orleans airport. Right. We decided to stay because it was a big event for us. I think it was Moscow, right? Yeah, they one were of the last Moscow. qualifying event. And you can't get to Moscow from New Orleans. I it's mean, you terrible. Know. Yeah. yeah, but we were waiting there in Moscow, and when they got there, they told us. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but basically, they had said whoever wins the first 
set wins the second because they didn't have time to go to three. Mm. So they made a pack. A pack. Four. That's great. Whoever wins the first set. Well, yeah, they had a fly. I'm pretty yeah, sure they were on flights second. that were going from New Orleans to JFK. And they didn't have that much of a waiting time in, at JFK to then connect to Moscow. But I remember thinking to myself, too, if you, you're a high-level athlete and you don't get the time from a match to end to shower, to get the treatment that you need, and then you've got to go sit on two flights, the risk of you getting injured over there. Or and you can go back and look this up. I'm pretty sure that there were a few athletes who didn't Phil got fare well. got majorly injured yeah. in Moscow. Yep. It, there, were, there was a lot of... Uh, things that happened later that summer for a few athletes yeah but then I didn't see another beach tournament until uh, was it two years ago or three years ago World Series of Beach the last one that they had and it was 2017 with, with uh, Pitbull <laughs> I, never, I had never heard of Pitbull right in the I, think, I think it was 2017 yeah. because that was the NBL's last event in Long Beach and yes. just paired yeah. together yeah with that fact that's when we actually met in person at that yeah. tournament yeah, yeah, we were there. there right exactly exactly and that was that was different, but that was kind of fun because I got to. It was a small field, so I got to take a lot of time to get to meet and know right. a lot of athletes that I wouldn't have gotten to know otherwise. Um, not the least of which was the thoroughly hilarious Laura Ludwig. She's great. I enjoyed awesome. visiting with her. Mm-hmm. God, she made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> she made me laugh. She is funny, and uh, but um, had great long conversations with Phil and Nick. Um, Jake Gibb a little bit, Ryan Darty, who we have mutual friends from outside of uh, volleyball and got to know, and all, all from you know, that that event. Yeah. And then, then that was when he dragged me to Vienna. I still have blisters on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we've had you guys here for a while. I know you want to get some food. We're about an hour ten. I know that's over oh, no. typical Olympia, like you're saying, Kat. But you know, somewhere in the refrigerator there might be some more. One more longer. That's true. Yeah. But we are at like Volleyball Magazine, a new face with 1440. Um, get a couple more toys to play with at a media day today. Um, so like, what's the future looking like uh, for you guys? Are we going you know, to get to do more things now that you're kind of partnered with a bigger team? Being kind of <laughs> You know, because for example, we had all these ideas. We wanted to expand it to juniors. We wanted to expand it to Brazil. And normally we would be, okay, how are we going to pay for this? Who are we going to get to buy into this? How are we going to promote it? Um, with P1440, if they see it as a viable idea, they green light it and we go for it. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know we don't have to play short game anymore. We can play long game if we know it's a valid idea, right. and and we can get it done. So it's it's really shortcutting for us, you know, a lot of time. Listen to me, people. Listen to me. No, I mean, <laughs> the name is kind of funky, P1440, okay? But there, there is a vision. There is an expectation of greatness on a tremendous scale. And all I can tell you is that in the next year, you're going to see even more things, not just from VolleyballMag.com, but from P1440. It's going to blow your little volleyball minds. And we're doing, we're doing amazing things on our end. You know, since we, for the same time period from last year 60 percent in page views and part of it's because of that part of it's because it's been an incredible ncaa women's season so far <laughs> you know it's like it's so exciting and what's going on but it's more content it's more resources it's travis coming back if you've never read travis's stuff go read it it's good, <laughs> it's good. And, and you know the whole the whole thing so we we have we have great goals and they'll they'll be achieved and, and this merger is a big part of it. Yeah. And so we're we're thrilled. We're we're thrilled. And uh, it's a it's a good thing. If it's good for us, and I mean this seriously, if it's good for volleyballmag.com, it's good for volleyball. Yeah. yeah and for so sure. that means it, it's good for the NCAA. It's good for the U- USA volleyball. It's good for the AVP. It's good for P fourteen forty. Yeah. It's good for the FIVB because it's more good coverage, more in depth coverage yeah. about a sport that if you're if you stuck with this this far, if you're into a, over an hour and ten, it's because right. you love volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> you're watching. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is great. I mean, thanks for having us. We really appreciate yeah. it. Well, yeah. thank you guys too for being a part of this from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, but yeah, no, we, should, we should give you this ball. No, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate you coming up with the name and uh, being a part of it from the beginning. Yeah. It looks like we're all kind of on the same boat now. So let's yeah, let's ride this thing. Got it. Good. Thank, thank you. Thanks for coming on, gentlemen. 
You the man. Shoots. Shoots. You're supposed to say shoots. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> shoot. What? What does that mean? You must not watch the show. What does that mean? <laughs>